Hello, puppies and kittens. We are uh, interviewing another author today. Uh, to, today I'm talking to John Wathy. He's the author of The Phantom God, uh, What Neuroscience Reveals About the Compulsion to Believe. Now, I haven't had a chance to read this book, but uh, but I am I have talked to a number of neuroscientists about this, and I am kind of interested that, uh, that and I've talked to a number of philosophers about this and neurophilosophers also about this and and what i've gotten from all of them consistently is that there is virtually no or no uh no support for mind body dualism you know the separate concept of a soul inhabiting a body and all of that neither in neuroscience nor even in philosophy so john wathy uh welcome to the show tell us a little about yourself sir Glad to be with you. Um, I should say, since we're talking about neuroscience, I should say a little about my academic background. I, I got a PhD from the Department of Neurosciences at UC San Diego in the lab of Ted Bullock, who is um, not really a very famous scientist, I don't think, but within a certain circle, he had a very good reputation. He was widely regarded as one of the founding fathers of what's called neuroethology, um, which is a, an, interesting, an interesting approach to understanding the brain. It, ethology, without the neuro part, is the study of animal behavior in its natural context. And ethologists are mainly concerned with the, um, the, the selective pressures that create some behavior and its role in the animal's reproductive success. So famous ethologists include Tinbergen and um, other people who study animals, um, you know, newly hatched chicks that have innate behaviors, things like that, and printing in birds. Those are some of the classic ethological studies. But when you put neuro in front of it, um, neuroethologists try to build on that foundation of natural behaviors to understand the brain. And the, the, the idea behind it is that the brain is so complex, so difficult to understand, that we have the best hope of understanding it if we can, if we can know in advance what problem a specific part of the brain is trying to solve. If we could completely understand what some part of the brain is trying to do, then we have a much better hope of understanding how it works, how it actually does it. So neuroethologists um, look for animals that have some very uh, well-characterized, highly specialized behavior. Like for example, the ability of a barn owl to hunt and localize its prey using only sound cues. That's, that's an amazing behavior but it can, it's one that can be sort of simulated in a lab. You can um, change the timing between the two ears of the sound stimuli you present to simulate different positions of a target. It's, those are the kinds of behaviors that neuroethologists go for. Uh, other examples are the um, electric sense in weakly electric fish or um, um, uh, sexual pair bonding and prairie voles, uh, song learning and songbirds, those kinds of things. So, so that's the background I come from. When you say in weakly electric fish, I mean, I mean, we're talking about, are we talking about like sensorial electrical fields? Yes. Yeah. They're, they're okay. not the kind of electric fish that generate so much current that they kill their prey with it. It's, it's not that kind of electric fish. They, but, but like the way sharks and, and other fish, detect movement around them yeah yes exactly right and um, sharks are very sensitive to electric fields that are generated from some exogenous source like the muscle muscles of a of a fish that's hiding under the sand or something they're very good at that i have These to wonder if, if humans were sensitive to electrical fields would we drive ourselves mad with the noise that we would suddenly perceive <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, was, I would think so especially if we're sensitive to um Wi-Fi, you know, like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Radio frequency stuff. It would drive us nuts. Yeah. So, with with in relation to the God question, I mean, you know, the book is, you know, about about you know the phantom God, and then your your first chapter, I noticed, will probably put a few people off. It doesn't seem that the subsequent chapters don't uh, 
don't sort of take this tack, but I can see where people would read, read the, tap, the, the title of the first chapter, Why is God Two-Faced? And maybe make a judgment about the whole rest of the book. So <laughs> yes, yes. help me understand the general thought there. Okay, the, the general idea is that um, I have tried, because of this background I've just told you about, this neuroethological background of mine, I, I see human behavior through that lens. And even way back when I was a graduate student working on something completely unrelated to religion, um, I was thinking about human religion through that lens. And I could see some things about religiousness that to me, I thought were first of all being kind of overlooked by those scientists, mostly psychologists and anthropologists who write about religion. And also so, something that could possibly give us a, a foothold into the into the into what the nervous system does in, in humans when, when, they're, when they're thinking and feeling religious stuff. So um, the basic idea is that I saw two very distinct dimensions of religiousness. And, and the easiest way I can summarize it, the easiest way I can say it is with that question that I use for the title of that chapter. Why is God two-faced? Why do believers tell you that their God will damn you to hell, yet in the same breath insist that he loves you unconditionally? <laughs> yeah, and you have to be God-fearing. In, yes, in order exactly. to you have to because be it's an God. abusive relationship. That's what that is. It's it's so it's such a blatant contradiction. It shows up in almost every religion in one way or another, and it, it just it just cries out for an explanation. Why 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 can't Christians even see this contradiction at the core of their theology? They're blind to it. And my answer to that question is that there are two very powerful intuitions burned into human nature by our evolutionary past that tell us that there exists this um, exalted alpha male figure who's the leader of the tribe or the group, the social group, and we must show deference, we must bow down, we must obey, we must sacrifice for the good of the group, do what the leader says, follow the leader under any circumstances. That's, it's kind of the cultish mentality. Um, that's one dimension of religion. And, and God is sort of a, a, an alpha male cult leader in, in, that, in that frame of, of religiousness. Um, but there's another completely separate selective pressure that tends to make people religious, and it produces a very different kind of religiousness. And that's the drive that occurs both in infants, when human infants are born and are helpless, uh, their drive to connect with their mothers and their mothers drive to connect with and nourish and take care of them. So this mother-infant bonding or mother-infant attachment is a very important uh, thread that goes through religion. And that's the part that I thought had been not adequately studied. And, and it, it harkens back to the ethological studies of Conrad Lorentz and, and Nico Tinbergen with newly hatched chicks, where they have, have an instinctive inert or, or innate model of the parent, a visual model of what the parent's head and bill look like. And they, um, they will, when they first hatch out without any learning experience, they will look for that and when they see their parent with a, these, these are herring gulls I'm talking about, they have a big prominent red spot near the tip of the bill. And when they see that red spot, they will instinctively peck at that spot to solicit feeding from the parent. Um, that behavior um, shows that they have some kind of crude, innate, built-in circuitry in their brain that tells them what their parent's head looks like and what they have to do in reaction to it. And I have the feeling that there's something like that going on in, in human infants, that we are born, human infants are born with some kind of innate expectation of the existence of the human mother. It's not a, not a very detailed image. It's a kind of a crude image of, of a being that's just out there wanting to help, willing to help, responsive to crying, able to help and feed and nurture and keep you warm and keep you alive. 
And that innate understanding is what's happening on the infant side of the mother-infant bond. And now what, what does that have to do with religion? Well, if, that, if for some reason that circuitry exists and persists into adulthood, but is lying dormant most of the time, not doing anything, because adults can take care of themselves and feed themselves, um, if they get into a situation where they're in a deep crisis of some kind, some, some emotional or financial or life-threatening crisis where they just feel helpless and desperate, then this circuitry could be activated because that helplessness mimics the helplessness of infancy. And that, that expectation on the part of the brain that there exists this savior out there, this vague, amorphous, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving savior that will save you and protect you, rescue you, that gives rise to a different kind of religiousness. That's the God of unconditional love. So that's that's what I mean by the two-faced God. There are these two distinct aspects of God. They're contradictory. They don't make sense together. But if you see them as products of these two um, aspects of human nature that evolution has produced, then they sort of make sense. I don't see many things in uh, many things about uh, humanity that are that are dichotomous. But I, I do. I do see contrasts between people who have a greater tendency to, let's say, be iconoclast versus those who tend to uh, strongly revere their ancestors, who find nobility in service to the king, uh, and 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 in serving legions, uh, and and you know holding to beliefs and everything. And I've, I've never understood how holding to a belief against all reason was a virtue but there are people who feel that way yes they're just never going to change their mind and they're going to stand by that and and they think that's a strength and i don't see that as a virtue at all but even this is the way dip, this way people contrast in their thinking and it's not always consistent i try not to put people into two separate boxes that way but you know there are there are overlaps and tendencies and that's what i'm talking about here I I get what you're saying about um, the notion of the of the, the 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 parent, you know, the father figure that that is seemingly everybody's deity. Um, for me, what seems to get more is that when and I, I've noted this a couple of times when you when you when you're doing anything and you think you're alone, you may not be. So whatever you do in the in in you know when you think that nobody's watching, someone may be seeing you. There may be, there may be admirers, there may be critics, you know, spying on you, whatever. And so it's best to behave even when you think you're alone, as if somebody is watching. And because we are the center of our own world, we have a tendency to think that everybody's you know, somebody's watching us all the time. You know, we're walking down the street. Ellen DeGeneres is this, this funny joke where you. You're, you're jogging or you're, you're walking and then you trip and then to cover up that you were tripping, you try to jog, but only for like five feet. So you look like you meant to do that. Uh, but nobody's really paying that much attention as much as we think they are. Mm -hmm. So it's not much of a leap to assume that somebody is watching all the time, even if we know that there's no one around, you know, that someone may be seeing us. It might be a predator. It might be a god. Mm hmm Yes, that's definitely an aspect of our of our nature. Also, that we we're social animals. We normally have other humans around us. We're just accustomed to that. We just assume that most of the time. And, and I agree. Yeah. So that was we were talking about uh, the first chapter. Why is God two faced? Would you Would you like to go through the various chapters, or we're, or are we going to talk about? There's three sections of the book: behavioral foundations, the circuitry of the sensed presence, which I think we were just talking about. And part three, neurotheology meets neuroethology. Which would you like to cover of these first? Or how would you like to do this? Well, um, I guess I would. maybe what I should do is step back a little bit and say something about um, another motivation I had for writing the book. One is, is just to express these ideas about religion from the neuroethological point of view, which is a, a new thing. 
And that's more, that's one of my main motivations for the book. But there was another one, which was that um, I really love neuroscience. I think it's a fascinating subject. And there, there have been some really great books written about neuroscience that make the subject accessible to a general audience. And I'm thinking here of books by uh, the great neurologists like V.S. Ramachandran or um, um, the, the uh, sorry, my mind is blanking out now, the guy who wrote uh, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for His Hat. Uh, um, Did you say Neo Ramachandran? Uh, V.S. Uh, Vilyan oh, okay. is his first name, yeah. Okay. The, and, the, the uh, famous Ramachandran. The there famous Ram Ramachandran, yes. <laughs> okay. and, uh, yeah, I tried and, to get an interview with him. Oh, I'm just, I'm too small a fish. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, so, um, but anyway, there are some neurologists who've written great books about um, neuroscience, but they either don't mention religion at all, or if they do, they... Um, they talk about it in the context of pathologies of the brain, of, of strokes and epilepsy and things gone wrong with the brain. So um, there are some other books that uh, pr uh, purport to talk about the neuroscience of the brain and, and, and the neuroscience of religion specifically. But for me, those have been very disappointing. They, they either don't do the subject justice, they oversimplify, or they, um, they just sort of go off the rails of the scientific method and say that the brain is an antenna designed by God to make a direct connection with his beloved human subject. So I, th I thought I could do, I think I thought I could do better. I thought I could write a book that would be accessible to a general audience, but that would be scientifically rigorous and try to try to answer the question, what does neurobiology have to say about human religiousness? So that's just sort of by general motivation for what, it. What uh, concepts do you cover in that? I mean, I mean, one of the things that I, they often hear, that I often hear um, misunderstood in this topic is like, you know, consciousness. You know, people don't seem to have a, con have a notion of what consciousness is. Or very often, and I've even seen philosophers have this failing, where they think that you either have consciousness or you don't, and that it's uh, that like like um, I forget what his, his name now, but somebody was suggesting that when you have your ten billion and ninth neuron develop, then suddenly the light comes on and you have consciousness where you didn't have consciousness, you know, previously. But as I understand it, I mean it's it's like with sight, you know, you have varying degrees of acuity in vision. And so it would be with you know, with with consciousness too. How do you how would you deal? Do you deal with that in your book at all? Not very much, really. Um, I have some thoughts on it, but that's that's not so much what what my book is about. I just kind of uh, first of all, I I think humans do have something that we can reasonably call consciousness. I don't think it's uniquely human. Um, I think. Um, a lot of other animals have it too, and like you say, to various degrees. I don't think it's an all or nothing phenomenon. So, if if your book was going in a different direction, then I'm sorry that I derailed a bit. I, I no, just, no, I no. Just, go ahead. That's so okay. Go ahead and put us back on the track, if you will. Sure, sure. My um, my track is uh, the the direction the book goes. Is it um, the, the first part, as you say, is. Um, is entitled Behavioral Foundations. And what I've tried to do there is to summarize the ethological part of the neuroethological neuro project, just the behavioral aspects of human religiousness that the rest of the book refers to and depends on. Um, I had discussed a lot of that in much greater detail in my first book, which came out in 2016, but I didn't want the reader to have to read that whole book to be able to understand this new one. So everything in there that that I refer to that I need sort of as a as a basis, an intellectual basis for the new book is in those first two chapters. The middle part of the book, which I call the circuitry of the sensed presence, that's kind of a kind of a journey through the brain. I, I visualize it in my own mind, or I thought about it in my own mind as I was writing it as kind of a a trek through the wilderness where I'm trying or where where we're exploring this unknown territory trying to 
show the reader where the interesting places are. And there are guide in finding those interesting places. And by that, I mean places likely to be involved in human religiousness, especially this, uh, what I call the neonatal root of religion, this uh, religion of the unconditionally loving God. Those places are, are, I think, most easily found by trying to find the parts of the brain that are involved in mother-infant attachment and mother-infant bonding. And when you take that approach, suddenly a whole uh, sub-discipline of neuroscience that most people would say has no relevance to religion at all, suddenly becomes relevant. And that is the science of mother-infant attachment, mother-infant bonding in non-human mammals. Um, all mammals have this to some degree. We all, 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 hum, all um, non-human mammals have to be attached or, or interacting with their mother for, for food and nurturance and warmth and protection early in their lives, some more so than others, but it's pretty much a universal thing. So a lot of research has been done on that. And I, I start off in that book, for example, in the very first part, first chapter of that part, um, asking where in the brain do we cry? What are the, what's the circuitry of crying, especially infantile crying? Um, and it turns out there's a lot of research on that. And um, the early ideas were that it's a brainstem thing, that you don't even need consciousness or cortex to do it. And there's a lot of thinking that newborn human infants don't even have any consciousness, really, and their cortex is kind of asleep and undeveloped. And they're mostly brainstem organisms. But the uh, more recent research paints a very different picture that there are cortical areas very important for crying and um, they're important for humans in that regard too. And if you look at those, the, the deeper you look at those areas, you see them connected to other nearby areas of cortex. The, I'm, I'm talking here about pre areas in prefrontal cortex. The anterior cingulate is, is mainly the crying area. But the orbitofrontal cortex, which is the cortex right above our eye, eye sockets, um, that is involved in intense emotions, um, reinforcement learning, um, reward and punishment, seeking things that are essential for survival, like food and water and attachment to other people. So, um, so I go exploring in that way. I, I, I follow what looks to be the circuitry that would be involved in mother infant attachment. And I talk about you know, neuroimaging studies of, of mother infant attachment. You said, that also, it, that it, you said that it doesn't actually require a brain to cry, for an infant to cry. I mean, I've seen where there, are, there have been babies that were, that were born or, or that, were, that were noted uh, that should probably be aborted because they were without a brain. There was a famous case where uh, conservatives wanted to force this woman to continue to have a baby after it was shown that the baby was not the, the, the baby was not going to have a brain. Yeah. And so what's the point in allowing it to grow bigger to cause her body more damage for a thing that cannot live? Right. And and arguably may not even qualify as human. I mean, how could you qualify as human if you don't have a brain? Yeah. But but it, um, my, my question is, you're saying that it doesn't require the brain to cry. I mean, is, is it something if, if you all you have is the, the brain stem and all of that? Could, could you have a child that deceptively cries? Yes. Even though it and can't, fact, that's, and that's disturbing. Where, that's where that idea came from. The, um, the microcephaly or anencephaly, the children born without a forebrain, without a cortex, um, they will cry, they can cry, and that does come from the brainstem. And, um, and that's where this idea came from, that, that uh, well, that's probably true of all newborn infants. Their cortex is there, but it's not developed. It's not really doing much of anything. But um, if you study those, if you look at those reports carefully, you'll see that the crying is, is very abnormal. And it's a reflexive kind of crying that probably is triggered by, you know, low body temperature and things like that, there's, um, 
the studies that um, show, point to the cingulate cortex, the anterior cingulate cortex in crying, um, were first done in monkeys where you could, um, you could either lesion those areas and see what effect that has on the monkey's behavior, or you could electrically stimulate in there and see if you can elicit crying. And the, the main result from those um, experiments was that um, what the anterior cingulate cortex does is it, 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 it is involved in the much higher order, the things you, we, we would call con the conscious aspects of infantile crying, where um, in the case of monkeys, they were, the context was social isolation. When a monkey is separated from its social group, it will emit these cries that sound like infantile cries, but they're, they're isolation contact calls. They're meant to you know, so elicit cries from the other group, members of the group so the monkey can find its way back to the group he's been separated from. Um, the, the ability of the monkey to do that, to give a, a contact call like that, a cry out like that when isolated, goes away if you damage the anterior cingulate cortex, even though that same monkey can still cry. It still has all the brain circuitry in the brain stem for generating crying. And it will cry in response to a cry that it hears from another monkey. Uh, that's sort of, that's a more reflexive thing, but it, it cannot make the connection between its isolated state. It cannot, without the anterior cingulate cortex, it doesn't seem to see its isolation as a dangerous situation that requires crying out. That it's, so that's the more sophisticated aspect of, of crying. In, yeah, I'm in afraid we might have, might have run, a, run us off on a tangent when I asked that question. So. That's okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm prone to doing that. I'm sorry. Yeah. So we'll, 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 we'll take it back to the phantom God then. Yeah. So um, anyway, in the, in the, um, in part two of the book, the circuitry of the sense presence, I just do a lot of what I've just now described. I go into a lot of detail for many aspects of of behaviors and feelings and sensations that are involved in mother-infant attachment, both in the in infants, mainly in the infant's brain, to the extent. That let I me let do. me ask you about chapter six. Um, okay. We, we, in part two, the circuitry of the sensed presence, we have chapter six, which is self, other, and the illusory sensed presence, and that I think we were discussing before, but I would like to hear a, a, elaborate on that a bit. Okay, because sure. The, the illusory sensed presence is what we were talking about as far as perceiving somebody watching over you and that someone is always somehow able to read your thoughts. Yeah, yeah. What I'm talking about there is a, the, the illusion of a sensed presence is something that happens not just in religious contexts. It, ha it can happen in many different contexts. Um, uh, one that's been studied a lot and reported a lot are are situations where, uh, for example, mountaineers are um, in some isolated situation. They may be separated from their, their fellow climbers, or maybe they're climbing solo. They get into a dangerous situation. They may be a little hypoxic, a little hypothermic, and, and they suddenly, you know, they're, they're they're starting to get worried. <laughs> They're in a situation they can't control anymore. It's now life-threatening. And very often in these situations, they will report feeling the presence of another climber or another person nearby. And it's a very uncanny thing that they, they can't quite put it into words. It's not a visual hallucination. They're not seeing another person, but they just feel that someone else is nearby. A similar thing was reported by um, Shackleton's um, team. I don't know if you remember that story. Ernest Shackleton, who was a polar explorer in the Antarctic, um, he was in a situation where he had to. He and a, a couple of his colleagues had to climb over a mountain to get back to a place in civilization where they could rescue the rest of their party. And it was again one of those situations. And even though there were other people, you know, there were three a group of three people. But two of those three people later reported feeling this mystical, vague presence, another person with them in this dangerous and life-threatening situation. So that 
this feeling of, a, of an illusory sense of presence is something that comes to people sometimes. Um, it tends to get the religious interpretation if someone already has been primed for that, if they've been brought up in a religious culture, or religious family, whatever. Um, yeah, I've noticed my, that many experiments, many experiments do depend on what people have already been taught and what they believe. Yes. So things will always comport to your expectations. Yes. And, and the point I would make about that is um, part of this I'm, I'm suggesting is something that everyone's brain expects because of this feature of human infancy that, again, is kind of hypothetical, but I present a lot of evidence for it, that human infants have this innate expectation of a mother's existence. So we all have that much. Whether we also expect there to be a Jesus, a God, an Allah, whatever, those things are layered on top of that and color the experience. Um, and Let that me ask you about... Sure. I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, in that particular chapter you asked about, um, self, other, and the illusory sense of presence, there I'm looking at a part of the brain called a temporal parietal junction it's, uh, it's in the back of the cortex, sort of above and behind the ear. So, you know, it's, uh, anyway, it's, um, it's a part of the brain that's, that deals with embodiment, with how the brain calculates what your body is doing in space, where your limbs are, how you're oriented in space, um, what your fingers are doing, all, all the sensations both from touch and from the sensations you generate by movement. All of those things are integrated in that part of the brain to give you a, a sense that you live in your own body, you're in control of your own body, you sort of know where your limbs are and what they're doing. Um, and it also interprets the bodies of others that you see. It contains mirror neurons, for example, that um, when you see someone else doing a behavior, you you kind of feel what their body is doing in your own body. You you can interpret what they're doing by reference to your own body. So that's the part of the brain that is seems to be in, involved in this sensation of a presence because it it senses both your own physical body and it interprets the physical bodies of others. Interesting thing about mirror neurons so when I what I've seen in dogs, I'm a little confused there because just as uh, just as one of the 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 metrics for intelligence in animals is whether they're able to recognize their own reflection or whether they're able to uh, whether they're able to watch television, for example, I've noticed that you know you know some dogs will actually watch TV and recognize what's going on. Uh, some of the smarter dogs and other dogs seem to be completely oblivious to the moving colors and shapes and two dimensions on the screen. At the same time, they're like, uh, one of my dogs has figured out how to open the sliding glass door, which meant <laughs> that I had to, and of course they never think to close it after them for some, for some reason, but that means that you know one of my dogs can get in all the time unless I have to get in or out, unless I you know, come up with the uh, workarounds for that. But the other dogs can watch the dog do that and not figure out how she's doing it. So this is, is an example of, you know, some dogs have, a, have the ability to mimic uh, human action. I've seen dogs making fun of how, uh, you know, babies walk or, or you know, where they do the same thing, where they make the same motions. And so that yeah. requires mirror neurons, right? But then yes. the other dogs yeah. can't seem to be oblivious to that. They can't, they can't mimic that way. Yeah. No, that's true. There's a wide spectrum there of, of intelligence and that kind of intelligence, I'm sure, in dogs and in, in other animals. I, I've read that you, what you just said reminded me of a, one of the papers I read about mirror neurons in monkeys. Um, there, they were interested in a phenomenon called neonatal imitation. This is one of the things that um, has been studied both in humans and in monkeys. Um, a newborn monkey. Um, held up in front of a human's face. If you stick out your tongue or move your mouth in some way, you know, various facial gestures, facial expressions. Um, monkeys tend to imitate that. And it's a subtle phenomenon. You have to 
videotape it and use proper controls and statistics, but um, it's been replicated and it, it holds up fairly well. Human infants well, I do would, this I would too. say that it holds up fairly well because we have the old adage, monkey see, monkey do. Yes, yeah. <laughs> it's one of the places that comes from, I guess. Uh, humans do this too. But in the case of monkeys, they don't do it all equally well. Some seem not to be doing it or, or do it very little. Others do it spontaneously and a lot. And when um, this particular study examined, you know, sort of segregated monkeys, infants, by their tendency to do this imitation and followed them later in life and followed their development. And, and the ones that were the best at um, imitating right after they were born developed their motor skills more rapidly, you know, earlier in their development. They, they just seemed to be ahead of the others. And it was probably because they had a more thoroughly developed or better endowed mirror neuron system. Okay. I'm going to ask you about uh, the subsequent chapters. Chapter seven uh, also looks very interesting to me. Certainty, uh, neonatal cortex, and the phantom god. And I'm primarily interested in the certainty thing because the, what what is really maddening for me in, in arguing with religion is that that's all that they seem to have is certainty. It doesn't matter what the facts are as long as you sound convinced. Yes. Or can you make yourself be convinced? Yes. Well, the, um, the kind of certainty I'm talking about there is very much the kind you just described. I, I, I call it um, short circuit certainty to distinguish it from a different kind of certainty, which is, I think, the kind you and I strive for. Um, scientific certainty. Scientists become certain of something only very reluctantly. We need to have a lot of evidence. And, and, and certainty for us is never really an all or nothing thing. It's a probabilistic thing. We, we think of a, a phenomenon or, or a belief or, or, some, or something is, is true, something is factual, only in proportion always, to the I've... evidence. I've had to describe my own position with degrees of certainty as well. Yeah. You know, I've often said, for example, I know, if I say that I know that God does not exist, I feel obliged to include that I know that in the same sense and to the same degree that I know that leprechauns are not real. Right. Yeah, right. Exactly. That's, the, that's exactly the, the point I'm making. And there's, in, in distinction to that, that, that kind of, of attitude toward truth and certainty does not come naturally or easily to most people. It's something we have to learn, I think. It takes training and effort. There's another kind of certainty that does come naturally to people. It's, it's an emotional sort of feeling. It's not a rational, probabilistic conclusion. And it's, it, it comes from some unconscious source. It comes from intuitions. And when it comes, some people are just absolutely seduced by it. That's, that may be their only way of deciding whether something is true or not, just based on these intuitive feelings. And that one, one of those, and that's the one I'm talking about in this chapter seven, is this feeling of certainty of the existence of the mother that a, that a newborn infant experiences right after birth that it's, that's not based on any kind of learning or probabilistic thinking or anything like that. It's innate. It operates instantly. It's like the, the herring gull chick knowing what it means to see a red spot on the end of a yellow bill. It's, it's just there, and they know what to do with it. Um, so that feeling of the certainty of a mother's existence gets transferred onto, I think, this certainty of the existence of God, if God comes to you in the same way as a feeling of a sensed presence. Part of the sense presence illusion is this compelling, overwhelming feeling, a certainty, you could call it, that this is real, even though you can't see this sensed presence, even though you can't reach out and touch it, it feels like it, you could. You can, you can actually localize it in space. A lot of these illusions are are described that way. I've had them myself a few times. I was going to say I've, I've had them myself as well. Yeah, yeah. I was a, uh, I was a, 
well, the best way I can describe it is a neo-pagan occultist for a while. And um, that that depends an awful lot on, on thinking and imagining that you can perceive things that you can't really perceive. You know, some of these uh, woo merchants would even describe it as uh, seeing or perceiving just beyond what the eyes can see. But that phrase now, I understand that to mean making shit up. Mm -hmm. If you're seeing yeah. beyond what your eyes can see, then you are imagining it. Yeah. But it didn't feel that way at the time. Right. I was sure. convinced that I had extrasensory perception. Sure. It's very easy to convince yourself of things like that. Um, like I said, that feeling comes naturally. That feeling of certainty comes naturally to us. The, the scientific approach to certainty doesn't. It does take effort and learning and training. One well, of the points would... much because I, I know I know so many people that that have none have, just have none of that. Mm. Uh, they 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 believe a thousand percent certain. And how how can my my question of how can you even be certain if you don't know what you're talking about? You know, there, there's there's no there's no getting through to some people on their on their belief system. Yeah. And when when we were talking about animals a moment ago, we were talking about you know comparative intelligence on dogs. I'm sorry to say that I've I've known plenty of people, especially in my family, especially in the older generations of my family, who considered animals to be autonomous machines. They're just mm -hmm. designed to look as if they feel pain. But they're just, the way I heard it put was, it's just a dumb animal. It don't know nothing. Mm -hmm. And it don't feel nothing. I've heard it both ways. Yeah, yeah, that's that's sad to hear. Yeah, <laughs> but, but I would um, I should add one more thing about that chapter seven, and that is that um, we've been talking about certainty, and I've talked about the certainty that you get with this feeling of the illusory sense of presence. There's another example of that that um, I cover in the chapter and is worth mentioning here, and that is when a person loses a limb to amputation, very often, almost in, in a high pro proportion of the cases, after the surgery, the person will tell the surgeon, I still feel my hand, it's still there. I, and, and, and they can look at it, look at the stump and see that it's gone and that it's an illusion. They know consciously, consciously that it's an illusion but they have this intuitive certainty that their hand is still there. This is called a phantom limb. And um, it's, I'm sure many of our listeners have heard about it. It's been written about a lot because it is such a common phenomenon and such a striking phenomenon. Is this there just are, because you've always felt that limb and so you don't know how to not feel normal yet? You haven't, you haven't learned at that level that you don't have that limb? Is that what it is? It's partly that, but I would, I would say, I would emphasize that um, we are embodied uh, beings. We, we can't exist, we, we, we can't even really conceive of what it would be like to exist without a body. And um, the brain is, is definitely wired that way. The brain is, um, the brain expects there to be a body that's keeping it alive and that it controls and interacts with and everything that we're the, the, that there's a lot of that that's built in and innate of course it, it, it develops and gets embellished through learning throughout life but there's some f f uh, interesting cases some fascinating cases and I describe a couple of them in this chapter of people who are born without limbs they're congenitally without limbs there was one case of a, of a woman who was born without um, her distal arms or distal legs. She had four stumps and um, she was a remarkable person because she was an, an adult. She was educated. She had gone through college, obviously with, with a lot of help, but she had a lot of determination. And she described having phantom limbs since as far back as she could remember. And some neuropsychologists studied her and, and did some neuroimaging on her. And they were able to, they, they did an interesting test where they, um, where, where she was, they were, they were asked to look at pictures of hands 
um, in different orientation, hands or feet in different orientations, and, and answer and tell whether this is a left hand or a right hand. And if the hand is in the position that's normal for you, that you would just see if you held out your hand in front of you like, like that, then um, it's your reaction time for answering the question is lower. If it's upside down, some weird orientation that you almost never see your own hand in, then you have to go through a process of mental rotation to, to figure out whether that's a left hand or a right hand. And it takes you longer to answer the question. So they gave her that test. And even though she didn't have hands at all, she showed the same delay in those questions that required the mental rotation. So it was clear that she was answering the question with respect to her phantom hands, even though she'd never had hands herself. So that's a, a very subtle and clever way of showing that she's not just making this up. She's not just saying that she has phantom limbs. There's good evidence that she really does. Um, and when they so did, this is uh, a good reason. This is a good reason why you you call part two the circuitry of the sensed presence. Yes, and yeah, and, and the um, go ahead. And 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 be, I guess the, the I'm kind of going off on a tangent again. Forgive me, but the point there was that um, this is good evidence. This particular case of the woman with 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 congenital missing limbs is good evidence that. A lot of this circuitry of embodiment is innate, it's hardwired, and the brain really expects there to be hands and feet, legs and arms, and um, it's so burned into the brain that when you remove the limb, it's still there in the brain. The brain still expects it to be there and it creates this illusion. And so by analogy, I make the case that this innate model of the mother that's left over from infancy is in effect creating a phantom other being, a phantom God. It's creating this illusion that there's this other presence there in the same way that the circuitry of embodiment creates the illusion of a, of a phantom limb. It, it's really the same circuitry. It's the same part of the brain. It's the tem temporal parietal junction. It handles embodiment of your own body, it handles in the interpretation of the bodies of others. So if you, in fact, you, if you electrically stimulate that part of the brain with it by putting electrode directly into the brain, which is sometimes done for epilepsy, um, sometimes you can elicit the illusion of a sense of presence just by doing that in the, in this so part it's of like, the brain. So it's like you've got the software drivers, but you don't have the, the hardware for it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I want to ask you also about you know, if we could, we should at least quickly summarize part three. Neurotheology, uh, which is an interesting concept in itself, meets neuroethology because you, you talk about the image of God, the helmet of God, the flesh of God, the madness of God, the handedness of God. And, and we, I'd like to know what you're talking about there. I mean, I, I, I wish that I had time to read the book because I do find all of this interesting. And I just, you know, just time is just a huge issue for me. I don't have right. any. <laughs> so, right, right. But uh, so have, please give me a summary of what you're talking sure. about there. With the, what I'm trying to do in the last part of the book is to um, put in, so, so I, I wanted to look at some of those other books that have been written about the neuroscience of religiousness and try to reinterpret some of what they say in light of this idea, this neuroethological approach to religion and the brain. So um, there, there's been a, a whole lot of stuff written about, um, um, well, some of it's neuroimaging, where you put somebody in a brain scanner and have them pray, or um, you may have them speaking in tongues or something, some, some aspect of religiousness and or religious ritual and then you look in the brain and see what's there what what can i say about it um there was another notorious case of a scientist um named Michael ah, so when you're talking about the helmet of god yeah you're not there, there's two concepts there because people will put on the helmet of god which essentially means that you've steeled your mind against all reason that's a that's a phrase that i've often heard and it's it, it's 
completely irritating to me because it's an admission that you're going to be unreasonable. But you are talking about the experiment. Yes. Of God. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for that clarification. Yes. And although what the interpretation you gave may have some relevance to it, too, I hadn't didn't have that in mind, but it's, a, it's an interesting thought. But the the uh, Michael Persinger had the, uh, is a Canadian uh, psychologist who put magnetic coils on a motorcycle helmet and put people in an isolated chamber, uh, sort of a, a sensory deprivation chamber, and would put strange magnetic, oscillating magnetic fields in their brain and just have them report what they experience. He claimed that these magnetic fields would cause people to have this sensed presence illusion. Um, got a lot of notoriety in the 1990s, and then in the early 2000s, a group in Sweden tried to replicate his results. They collaborated with him. They sort of used equipment just like his and his protocol and everything, and they could not reproduce the results, at least not in a way that showed that the magnetic fields had any influence on these sensed presence illusions. They did have subjects report sensed presence illusions, but they had no cor there was no correlation with the magnetic fields. There was, however, a correlation with the psychological suggestibility of the subjects. There was some psych psychometric test for measuring that, and the subjects who were high in suggestibility were the ones most likely to have these sensed presence illusions in the deprivation chamber. I so have I to apologize. About... Somebody has a dog barking outside, and that's called okay. my dogs. Just shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I, I heard this dog, this little puppy, I can hear it barking outside. I'm like, no, no, no. And, but then they went off. <laughs> I'm holding one of their leashes right now, just trying to keep okay. it quiet. I wasn't able to hear anything you said because I had to go on. <laughs> shut up. Oh, man. I hate this. So, anyway, the um, <laughs> yeah, the, go uh, ahead, the please. Um, the the, uh, the 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 main point of that chapter was that um, this Michael Persinger's guy, his results were not particularly um, believable. They weren't reproducible. He was kind of deceiving himself, I think, uh, not not really doing proper double blind controls, but. In fact, there is uh, a technique for stimulating the brain with magnetic fields. It's called transcranial magnetic stimulation. The magnetic fields they use to do that are about a million fold greater in intensity than the ones Persinger was using. But if you use strong enough magnetic fields, you can excite the brain with magnetic fields. And when you do that, it, um, it kind of scrambles, it temporarily scrambles the computation in that part of the brain. It's just kind of random stimulation you're doing there. And, it, and it, it's, it's, almost, it's, it's sometimes been described as a virtual lesion. You're damaging the part of the brain. You're kind of eliminating the function there temporarily. It doesn't do permanent damage, but for as long as you're applying the magnetic, magnetic field and for some time afterwards, that part of the brain isn't working right anymore. And that's been a very useful experimental technique for figuring out what's happening in people's brains. And I spend the rest of the chapter talking about that and about real lesions, physical lesions, strokes, and physical injury to the brain that knock out certain parts of the brain that may affect people's religiousness. Um, you talk at all about near-death experiences. Um, in this book, no. I've um, heard, I've heard it brought up many times that this is like the most compelling evidence, except that after 50 years of various experiments, they've got, you know, maybe you know, maybe a handful of things that they that they say, OK, well, we can't explain this, which, of course, people will say that, you know, anything that, that science doesn't explain is somehow explained by magic or is somehow evidence mm -hmm. of magic. But, right. The vast majority of them are not only explainable, but the few times that it's not explained, they're also inconsistent in that uh, you, you will have people, you know, if you raised Hindu, for example, you know, in a near, near death experience, there are people who have reported meeting their Hindu gods and they would come back from the near death experience claiming proof of reincarnation. So 
how then can you argue that that is evidence of your Christian God? If this is, you know, if you're a Christian apologist, you're going to, you know, mention NDEs as your primary evidence, knowing that the Hindus report a completely different religious experience and it's mutually exclusive. And therefore, if they can be experiencing what you know to be not true, then you could, you could be experiencing what they know to be not true. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I'm glad you brought that up. I, I think it, it is a fascinating subject. I've, I wrote about it in my first book, which is called The Illusion of God's Presence. Um, I have a, I do have a little bit about neuroscience. I like that book. title. <laughs> I, should, I should look that one up too. Go ahead, please. But uh, there, I, I, I devote one chapter to the one of the questions you brought up very early in our conversation, which is do, uh, dualism, uh, the idea that the consciousness can somehow be separated from the brain. And I, I, I devote the entire chapter to arguing against that idea that um, we very often hear that, uh, well, it, un unless neuroscientists can explain how neurons produce consciousness, then it's an open question. But I, I, I say that I, I disagree with that. I think that's kind of a red herring argument that it's true we cannot fully explain how the brain produces consciousness, but that's not the relevant question here. The question is not how does the brain produce consciousness? The question is simply, does the brain produce consciousness? That's a much simpler question. And there's well, good, think, good evidence for that. Yeah, but I, I, wanna, I wanna say, I've noticed how you have a stimulus response. I mean, everybody's noticed you have you know when you look at working uh, studying with protists for example you know and an media an amoeba is enveloping a uh, i'm trying to i'm trying to remember what the what the other species is but you know an amoeba is engulfing some other protist mm -hmm. and when the protist suddenly comes to a point of realization that it's being engulfed and that it, and that it, there's no escape now it's be so it then goes into a panic mode where suddenly it's it's moving extremely rapidly trying to find an exit right so this is a a, f a fight or flight response in an animal or not even an I mean, sorry this is not even an animal this is this is a microbe a that has yeah. no brain yeah but like with slime molds for example slime molds have been shown how, how that they can chart their way through a maze that they have a degree of intelligence that, that that's they even have a degree of memory not one neuron yeah so I would I would say that of course we do have evidence that the brain produces consciousness, but it doesn't have to just be that. Right, right. Um, the, the, I conclude when I when I in this chapter about dualism, I, I conclude by discussing this uh, near death experience, the especially out of body experience, which is kind of a subset of them, where in surgery. Every once in a while, someone recovers from surgery and says, oh, I was hovering over myself in the operating room and I could see what they were doing to me and my mind had separated from my body and I, was, I must have been dying at that moment. I must have been near death then. Um, there have been attempts to put some kind of visual cue, like a, a number, a six-digit number on a piece of paper suspended from the ceiling where someone on the ceiling looking down could read it, but no one else in the room could. Um, and none of those has ever produced a positive result. So I remain yeah. highly skeptical. There's never been anything compelling unless, unless you're just desperately looking for any reason to believe. Right. Yeah. So let's, uh, let's summarize and go ahead and close it up. Um, I would like to to uh, let's include the links to you know, how do you obtain your books. This is a this is published through I forget. It's uh, Prometheus Books. Prometheus, that's right. Pull it up. Yes, Prometheus Books. Okay. All right. We'll make sure to put the the link down below so that you can get that and any other links that you want to include. Please make sure to share those. And um, let's let's uh, get a final thought on this. Um, my final thought, I guess, would be that. Um, you know, traditionally, going back, I don't know, for as long as humans have existed, we've tended to project onto things we don't understand um, some kind of God, some, some kind of supernatural force. Uh, 
uh, whenever there were storms and thunder and lightning, that the gods were angry. And as science has evolved and advanced, more and more of those things have been explained in completely naturalistic physical ways that have nothing to do with supernatural beings. So not very many people, at least not very many educated people, think that when there's thunder and lightning, it means that Thor is angry. But, but the God, so this is the God of the gaps I'm talking about. Whenever there's something we don't understand, we put God in there to, to explain it. And, and the, the places where the God of the gaps can still exist is shrinking all the time as science advances. But for intelligent, educated people, even scientists, highly distinguished scientists like um, Francis Collins, for example, the director of the NIH, um, if you read his book, he um, makes it clear that one of his main reasons for believing in God is this sensed presence experience. And he talks about um, this feeling of what he describes as a God-shaped vacuum in the human heart and mind. Why do we have this God-shaped vacuum? Unless it's meant to be filled by a God. But well, I, would, I, I appreciate what he's saying, but I mean, we obviously don't all have that. I clearly don't. Right, so, <laughs> I'm sorry to some, interrupt again. Go ahead. Sure, sure. Some people never experience that. A lot of people do. He evidently did. That's that's one of the places. And 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 I I would argue he's he's having or has had that kind of sensed presence experience that I've been talking about. And he still sees that as something that science can't explain. And so he defaults to God as his explanation. He puts the God of the gaps there. And I would just say that um, what I've tried to do in my book is to plug that one additional hiding place for the God of the gaps. I'm trying to explain that in a completely naturalistic scientific way this is something that comes from something intrinsic to human nature, comes from human infancy, comes from the powerful mother infant attachment that we humans have. And there's no need to put a God in there to explain those feelings or experiences. Thank you very much. On that note, I'll go ahead and close it up. Do include my links or do include your links so I can, so I can put them in, in the description below. Uh, John Wathy, um, and I wish I had time to read your book because it it is a fascinating topic to me, and and I maybe I'll find mostly. yeah maybe maybe I'll find time uh, in the next few weeks. It's just not possible at the moment. Okay, well.